digital is not definable by any single thing other than bits and bytes, but it, it manifests itself in so many different ways. Mobile, desktop, uh, streaming, video, these are all digital applications. Um, and, that, and it's that complexity and the diversity that makes it hard to track for anybody. Welcome to the Magnificent Marketing Podcast, where we interview the top marketing experts in the world and keep you up to date on all the changes and best practices to help you grow your business and stay on the cutting edge. Welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. I'm here today with Bo Sachs, and Bo is a veteran of the printing and publishing industry since 1970. He started his career with the founding of his own weekly newspaper in the, in the metro New York area. After several years in the alternative press, publishing newspapers in New York and Tucson, he went on to become one of the founding fathers of High Times magazine. Bo's resume lists uh, directorships at such prestigious companies as McCall's, Time Inc., New York Times Magazine Group, International Paper, Ziff Davis, EMP, and Bill Communications. Today, Bo's firm, Precision Media Group, does private consulting and publishes Heard on the Web Media Intelligence, a daily e-newsletter that delivers pertinent industry news to a diverse, worldwide publishing community of over 16,000 media industry leaders. It is the longest-running e-newsletter in the entire world. And today, we are, going to be look, we are going to be talking about looking into the future of online advertising. What can we expect and predict? Bo, how are you doing today? I'm great, David, and thanks for having me back. It's always fun to have these conversations. Oh. It really is. It really is, especially with you. You um, you don't hold any punches. Um, you know, you um, you know, you, if something looks good, you say it. If something looks bad, you say it. And uh, you're, you're as bipartisan as it gets when it comes to traditional in-line media. Very, no, I appreciate get a that. Very unbiased take. Well, that's exactly uh, how you position yourself. <laughs> that's how you come across. That's who you are, and uh, it's wonderful having people who well, aren't. The, uh, I mean, it's great the to funny, have the people who publish, who push the. Go ahead. The funny thing is that um, I have discovered long ago that speaking the truth can be lucrative. Well, that's, uh, that's, I wish everybody uh, thought that way, but. <laughs> Especially in the, in the state of our country right now, right? But uh, yeah, no, but yeah, but you 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 really do, you really do. So, so um, you know, whatever we talk about today is going to be is what it is. So, um, as we get before we get going here, I want you to first um, speak a bit on the current state of the online and advertising space. Is it stabilizing? Uh, is it still correcting itself? What what what's going on? Um, neither. It's neither stabilizing nor correcting itself, it's getting complicated. You know, the they, they say that the uh, the best test of a first-rate intelligence is to hold two opposing ideas in your mind at the same time and be able to function. Well, that's what's happening. There's conflicting ideas going on in the ad industry right now. We are so filled with so much fraud that it's hard to tell mm -hmm. um, the good players from the bad players, you know, and for this, it's, it's just everywhere. We've got box, we've got viewability, uh, we've got ad blockers, we have apps, millions of apps that have been downloaded that uh, carry illegitimate clicking functionality. One of those bots produces 1 billion fraudulent ad impressions per minute. So, no, we're not stabilized in any way. But, you know, and that's why I said about first-rate intelligence holding two opposing ideas, I really believe we'll solve this. I don't know how. It'll be lucrative and honest. I don't know how. Because we're not going to go back. We're not going to retreat from a digital communication platform. Well, what gives you the confidence and faith that this will be corrected? I am a pragmatic futurist. There, I don't see any path of retreat. Businesses aren't going to go back to an analog system, no way, shape. It's just not going to happen. So 
we have to figure out a path to fight the fraudsters. Unfortunately, those who perpetrate fraud are always one step ahead of those who are trying to create the rules. So it's going to be a long-term dynamic till we, till we figure this out. Um, and I can't tell you how we're going to figure it out. I just believe that we do. We will. We have to. There's billions and billions of dollars yeah. of fraud being wasted, you know, which kind of brings me to the interesting last week, I think it was last week, the National Association of Advertisers proudly uh, suggested that ad fraud is going to drop 10% this year from $7.2 billion to, I think it was $6.5 billion. <laughs> like, yeah. okay, that, that is totally ridiculous. You know, any yeah. kind of quantifying statements on this topic are at best a guess. There is no science to determining ad fraud. It's not it's not trackable. There's no benchmark from which to make a declarative statement. Um, there's no way to so know. You don't you don't have faith that I mean well first of all the statement in itself is fairly comical. I mean granted trending in a positive direction no matter where you are in business, you know, really low or really high, doing really bad or really good, it's still a good thing if you're trending the right way. But it's still kind of comical to, to throw out uh, a billion number like that and, and, and say, hey, this is a positive thing. I mean, that's, it's horrible, period. But, it, you know, what, what, why would they make that statement? Why do they think the ad fraud? I mean, are some, I know some bigger companies out there uh, pulled out of what, YouTube or, or because they were, you know, it wasn't necessarily ad fraud, but they were getting placed next to um, other ads and other companies that they didn't want to be associated with. So, you know, so they did that, which helped correct some of, some of that issue. But are some of these bigger companies and bigger media outlets and bigger organizations, are they doing things that are um, possibly driving down that ad fraud number that you know of? No, I don't believe it. They're making moves political moves, uh, marketing moves, suggesting that we're correcting all of this. But it's so out of control, there's no way there's no way yet to do it. And your suggestion that isn't it good that it's going down a little, um, I counter with there's no way to know that. That is a biased uh, an assessment by an association whose job it is to promote digital advertising. So anything they say at best is uh, suits their own purposes. And no, I don't believe that it's down 10% because you can't quantify anything that you can't measure. And there's no way to measure the totality of ad fraud. How do you measure bots? How many bots Even are Even after there? it happens? Yes, there's, yes. Because it's not like people rob a bank and that's a fixed universe and you know there was a million dollars in there and then you can say well they robbed the bank there's a million dollars missing you're talking about billions of ads on on millions of websites and there's there's no central bank to determine what's missing it's a it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where programmatic advertising just keeps churning on and on there's not a beginning and an end it's continuous. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, you probably put the, you know, fear of God into some people here in regards to doing any online advertising. How would one know that they're getting their money's worth? I mean, at all? I mean, is there is there any way? <laughs> no. I mean, I'm, quite frankly, I don't <laughs> think there's any credible way. Um, sure, there are lots of people suggesting lots of things. Um, you know, I, I'm trying to develop this, this I, I'm trying to grapple with it. So you have online advertising and then you have all the millions and millions of dollars being spent in social media. Is any of that worth anything? And is there fraud in the marketing spend in social media? And I think that if there is that much ad fraud, there's an equal amount in social media fraud. and. What does it mean? I have no idea, but I can tell you this. Um, there was a study by Duke University 
and I think it was the American Marketing Association too. And in their study, over 88% of senior marketers surveyed said they could find no measurable impact from social media marketing. Okay, 88% said there's no measurable impact. Why does it continue to go on? I have no idea. Well, what, what, what's going? What's happening? What's going to happen here? I mean, you know, are, is there going to be a gravitation back towards traditional media that you see? I, I've heard you uh, talk about trust news here just recently in the last couple few weeks. I don't know if that's a new term going around, but I just noticed it. Um, you know, is trust news traditional media? Is it still online? Is it, you know, or again, like I said, originally, I mean, are people going to gravitate back? Like, wh wh where do you see the future? Wh where do you see wh where we're headed? We've right. kind of talked about this. We about said 10 minutes really ago, the future, the future is digital. Will there be okay. trusted media in digital? The answer is yes. Um, you know, do you take your top players, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Washington Post, these are what are traditionally called trusted media. That's simply a case of being properly branded over a hundred years. Their brands have uh, trust built into them. So that trust is uh, indifferent to substrate. The trust come from paper, come from digital, doesn't really matter. You've built the trust over a long period of time. But as we said 10 minutes ago, there is no retreat. We will continue to move forward in the digital world and make it work to the best of our ability. I question and wonder if we can waste $7 billion, how much money is there out there um, that you can afford to lose $7 billion? What's the other side of that coin? <clears throat> How can any system afford to lose that unless there's so much um, slack built into the system that you can afford to lose that much? Are we actually overpaying so that people can eat $7 billion? I don't have the answer. It's an interesting question. Well, well I think you would have to assume that, you know, even though there's a problem with um, – digital advertising and bots and, and all, you know, but there's obviously a value being brought some form or fashion. And some things are, have to be working because you're right. If you're just wasting money, I mean, at some point, and I think at this point it would have already just turned people off like, well, this is just a complete waste. So there has to be some good things going on. I mean, it just, there just has to, and I, I can speak from experience that there is, you know, I mean, we see, we see positive uh, movement if you do things the right way, but um, you know. So you know, with that, I think fair assumption. Would you agree that there has to be some good stuff happening? I mean, what's you know, where where have you seen the best places to spend your digital dollars? You know, is it through sponsored content, banner ads, native ads, programmatic? Is it social platforms? I mean, I mean, there has to be lesser. You know, if we're looking at these as potential money wasters in certain aspects, um, you know, let's put them in order as far as you, you know, you're concerned. If you're going to spend any money, do this or do that. Do you have any, any take on that from your experience and what you're, you're seeing out, out there? Well, you're, you're pointing towards the uh, ROI, the return on investment. And my contention is that not all ROI gets the proper attention that it deserves. Um, there are better places to spend your money and get an increased return on investment. You just mentioned native advertising. That is wildly successful right now. But I think that's going to blow up in everybody's faces because native advertising is nothing more or less than um, an advertorial, a disguised advertorial. There was a time when we proudly put on the top of an advertorial that that's in fact what it was. Now we disguise it. We disguise ads as edit. Um, it's working and it's working while we are duping the public, but I think they're going to get wise to it and probably dry up. Um, um, so sponsored content, native content, publishers 
are desperate right now to make a living, to make a profit. And so they're trying desperate things. I don't think native advertising is a good idea in the long term. Well, you mentioned sponsored content. You know, if you are matching the right brand to, you know, a high piece of content, you know, that, that could be really brand. It is working. You mean, do you see it that way as well? Or? It's working right now. Um, I'm, I think it's, in fact, wildly successful. I just think it has a shelf life. I think eventually, mm -hmm. um, like fish, it's going to be left out of the uh, water far too long and start to smell. Okay. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I've heard you, you know, talk about traditional media and, and how, you know, it's, you know, potentially, you know, shrinking, not potentially, but is shrinking and shrinking. And, you know, we're talking about digital now and how digital you're kind of, you know, wary against. Well, what do we do? You know, we don't have traditional digital scary. What, what, what do you suggest? Say you're starting a company or you're, getting, you're consulting with somebody and you're looking to get the word out about them. What, what would you suggest they do then? I am not in any way suggesting digital isn't effective and isn't the future. Digital is the future. But there are just, we have to understand that there are problems. Um, there are areas that we have to be concerned about and build bridges around, over, through. Um, there is no retreat. And there's billions of dollars in advertising heading towards digital that has to be corralled. So that's the problem. Or the answer is figure out how to corral it. Now, we mentioned trusted media a few minutes ago. <clears throat> Placing an ad in trusted media doesn't guarantee an ROI, but it has a certain amount of credibility to it that humans will actually see this. They, the place where your ad is isn't, um, isn't a fraudulent news site. Um, there's, there's no way around moving forward. I don't know well, the answer. I don't know the answer to how we form credibility. The one thing that makes sense to me, which isn't going to happen, is to diminish programmatic advertising. When you have a non-human placing ads, the non-human places those ads in mysterious ways, in mysterious places, and um, with mysterious results. We need to add now, a human element to the yeah. programmatic buy. Now, that could be artificial yeah, intelligence. Yeah, one thing you can do. Well, yeah, possibly. Now, one thing people can do, you know, it, you know, to know, and this is something I personally discovered, and we actually quit um, a specific programmatic company. Uh, you know, we, we test, but you got to track, you know, and you can track through, you know, your Google Analytics and see that's where the traffic is coming from. And if you're seeing a bunch of three second, th three second visits <laughs> uh, or, you know, even 15, 20 second visits, you know, something's off, you know, right. you know, something's off. So, you know, you, you can, you know, look at your analytics and, and at least discover the, you know, the big red siren bad traffic coming in. Um, you know, that, that's obvious, but I assume that you're right. Fraud people, uh, you know, are getting smarter and smarter and they're probably figuring out ways to make somebody stay on a site for 30, 40 seconds or whatever, even though it's still a crappy site. I mean, a crappy click. Um, so, but, but you can at least identify the, the obvious ones by, by looking at your, uh, by looking at your analytics there, but I mean, let's circle back just like some some solutions. And I know you're, um, you know, you know, you built your credibility by not saying, well, this is the answer, and, and that's you know very respect respectful. But let's, you know, let's have you kind of stick your neck out and, and make some predictions or give some advice, even though it, you know, everything's going to be said with, hey, we don't know this for sure, for certain. But we're definitely looking to give some solutions for people to deal with this, you know, ongoing and, and future issue Here. that we're dealing with. So right. here's you know, my prediction. You said at the very beginning, go ahead. Here's my far-fetched prediction. Eventually, 
we build uh, artificial intelligence with a definable moral barometer. Artificial intelligence that knows right from wrong. If you can do that, you can place ads programmatically because it understands what's inappropriate. Are we near that? Maybe. Will that happen? Something like that has to happen. And that could be part of the solution. Okay. And what about going back to the uh, the media side? You know, we talked a little bit about trust news, trust media, becoming trusted. I mean, obviously, um, logical answer is, well, just put out good information, and, and maybe that's the beginning and end of it. But, you know, what have you seen certain organizations do anything specific to get that trusted label, so to speak, um, so that, you know, obviously, if you become the trusted source, well, then – you'll be able to pay you, more for your you, advertising. You get trust by continuity, <clears throat> and um, that takes time. Vice is a great example. Vice came out of almost nowhere and is now a trusted digital media brand, breaking out into all areas of communication. They're in print. They're on the web. They have TV shows. They are a brand-new trusted media. They do good work. They get known. New York Times has been around for 100 plus years. They do good work. They are known. They're doing their best not to screw up the brand. Continuity of message. Be good. And for a while. <laughs> for a good while. Um, is there anything you else you've seen? Yeah. Is there anything that, like, how do, I mean, is that just is what it is? Is continuous to put out good information? Is there, are there any companies out there? You know, back in the day, I remember, you know, like, I mean, not back in the day, currently as well. I mean, there's, although I'm sure you have a raised eyebrow about these companies, but when people would do circulation audits, you know, there's companies who would do that. Um, you at least get to validate what you were putting out there. Um, is there anything on the horizon where there are companies who are going to be, you know, the the judge and jury of, hey, you know, here's our stamp of approval. I mean, this is a, you know, a site. There are dozens of companies. You know, that are, yeah. Yes, there are dozens of companies that are attempting to be the de facto leader in quantifying um, truth. Um, truth, in this case, non-fraudulent advertising. I don't think anybody's there yet because we started this conversation, or at least I did, that the fraud is not yet quantifiable. And if there's so much of it and manifesting itself in so many different ways, it's hard to wrap your arms around it. Um, but we're making the attempt. And I don't know who will be the leader in this, but someone will, or multiple someones. Because the truth is it shouldn't be a single organization. Um, digital is not definable by any single thing other than bits and bytes, but it, it manifests itself in so many different ways. Mobile, desktop, uh, streaming, video, these are all digital applications. Um, and, that, and it's that complexity and the diversity that makes it hard to track for anybody. But we'll get there. You should start up this company, Bo. <laughs> why, why don't you get involved with something? Because I mean, I, I think I mean really though. I mean, I think the the you know the industry needs you know a, a bank because I mean you you, know, you have your tags for hey we're a secure site, you know those mean something you know and it's real you know hey you know those circulation numbers assuming it's a credible company, um, you know they meant something, um, you know and the same might do go with this, you know, um, and, and it seems super important. I mean, are, are there any? There are uh, dozens of people more qualified. Who, it's happening. It's well, happening. Well, it, what's one or two of them that you um, can, can you know, speak to and validate? Like, hey, this is a, you know, pay attention to what they're doing. If you're a publisher, you might want to, you know, reach out to them um, in the future to, to be audited as a trusted audit or whatever it's going to be called. There's any, there's no. I declare I'm ready to declare as um, qualified, and I, I don't profess that to be an area of my expertise. 
There, you know, there's tons of people doing it. Have any of them gotten it right yet? Maybe. Um, it's hard to say. All right. Well, do you have any other um, good examples of uh, other companies that you feel are heading in the right direction, um, kind of maybe swimming against the stream to to get to brighter pastures, to speak, you know, before other people do, even though it might it might take some lumps uh, right now, but they're they're heading in the right way, and you know, anything that they might be doing that that you commend or or you know acknowledge well, the right path. There's, there's there's tiered layers to that. Um, you know, in a way, you can break the media, the magazine media industry, if you will, down to three segments. The super large, the Hearst, the Condes, the Time Inks, the middle players, which is a great example, is active interest media. And then you have your smaller moms and pops, the uh, city regional magazines. So they're all doing different things. And in each one of those layers, like I think Hearst is doing fantastic work um, in recreating themselves and reinventing themselves and even coming up with new print titles and then being smart enough to pull back and going, that's not work, but that's not going to prevent us from trying it again. Um, Hearst is invested in television and in digital applications. Active Interest Media does events and they do uh, they have digital applications for their titles. Every title has an alternate revenue stream. Um, and then your mom and mops. Everybody's doing, everybody's scrappy now. I would say that <clears throat> on a whole, media industry is scrappier now than it's ever been before because it's harder and they're working harder. They're more vibrant than ever before. You know, it sort of reminds me of something Joe Sexton said from the New York Times. It's a great quote. He said, uh, ain't no room for cowards in media at this moment in time. If you're not asking yourself every couple of years how to once more scare yourself to death, then you're living something of a coward's life. It's a great perspective, and that's what we all need to do, reinvent ourselves on a weekly, daily, yearly basis. I think that's what life's about. It's about growing and getting better. You know, doesn't matter where, where where you start or even necessarily where you end. It's just your journey the entire time, and uh, continue to get better and learn lessons and improve yourself. Uh, That's right. What, what about Hearst? You mentioned they're doing fantastic work. Um, what what's fantastic about it? Their philosophy is fantastic. David Carey has um, makes no bones about it. <clears throat> He's not afraid to fail. He just wants to fail fast. And that's a really great way to look at the current business environment. You have to experiment. You have to try new things. Um, and you also have to be ready to pull the plug if those things don't work. Bravo to David. What are, what are some of the things that they're doing that you see working for them? The reinvestment program. Um, well, they started with Dr. Oz recently, kind of went off very quickly, grew, and then they have some complications. And now it's down to a quarterly and perhaps even less than a quarterly, who knows in that direction. <laughs> it's just starting a new title, Pioneer Woman. Um, brilliant. You know, what, what, what many of these companies are doing, <coughs> sorry, is taking, um, known brands, many of them TV brands, and turning them into printed products and digital products, and it's working well for them. Pioneer Woman is a TV thing. And it's a, uh, go ahead. I was just saying they sound niche, too. It, sound, it sounds like, totally. you know, they're, they're definitely, they're not going big. They're going lots of, lots of, lots of smalls, you know, small for them, but, you know, Niche is a relative word, but uh, um, if hearing that, I mean, that's what they're focusing on and building specific audiences or products for specific audiences. Meredith's Magnolia Journal is a great example. In a matter of months, they have a million subscribers. Um, small, niche, 
uh, Lifestyle magazine out of nowhere. Well, not out of nowhere. There's a TV show um, that had a core element, a core niche, right built in to the product itself. Food Network is around for 10 years now, but that started as a TV show. Wildly successful brand. So it's interesting to say that these now, guys about, are starting uh, new you, publications, but with with a built-in base. That seems to be the success for the larger companies now. What about the medium and the smaller publishers? Is there different forms? Obviously, it's going to be hard for a local and regional you know, publisher to buy any sort of TV show. But what, what do, you, do you see any other differences in strategy for, um, you know, the smaller well, niche media? Let me answer there? that. Yankee Magazine, um, small regional title, covers at best six states, um, now has a PBS TV show. Um, called, I think it's called Yankee. Um, why would a Yankee show be interested to somebody in Colorado or Texas or, or Washington State? I don't know. But they're in 50 markets. I believe it's 50 markets across the country. So here you have a small little title that has managed to brand itself and expand across the country. Brilliant. How, how, how do you think they went about doing that? Uh, now you're How back to they, trusted they, media. They, yeah. Trusted exactly. media, they've been around oh, oh. for a very long time and went to the PBS station nearby, who obviously knew of them, started a dialogue, started a relationship. Now you have a TV show. Yeah, so, I mean, it really sounds like there's no there's no way around this stuff. I mean, you got to just do things the right way. I mean, you got to go niche, meaning that doesn't mean small. That just means specific. And um, do things consistently right for a long period of time and then make sure you start divi diversifying your offerings for those, be it a podcast or, a, you know, a, maybe a YouTube show for starters, you know, an ongoing channel that publishes shows and then maybe eventually grow to, to bigger deals, you know, network shows. And um, I mean, is that kind of what I'm hearing? You're just saying, hey, in this day and age, it's just going to take some. Anything's what, what possible. Years, but this, is, do things get sense? This, is, um, this is a great time to rethink the unthinkable. There's this, there hasn't been an age like this that I'm aware of throughout history. This is a unique and historic period where the unthinkable has never been more possible. It, it, it takes creativity and and guts. We live in a period of uh, experimentation and innovation and entrepreneurism that the world has never seen before. And it's going to compound even further and get more experimental and will achieve more unthinkable goals. It's quite exciting. I'm I'm thrilled to be in it and involved and observer of it. That's what I do. I'm a media observer. Absolutely. Well, um, okay. Moving forward, you you mentioned the AI. Do you have any other big out of the box as you see as a you know possibly in the near or distant future outside of? Uh, don't get me wrong, yeah, that was a pretty big prediction you made, which I don't think is that far-fetched, personally. Um, just seeing what's happened in the last two to three, four years, it's, it's unbelievable how fast this technology can, can, can grow, and there's a lot of concentration on AI. And um, So I, I don't think that's that out of the box, um, or far-fetched, I guess is a better better word. But do you see anything else? Do you have any other predictions? Yes. Uh, go ahead. Automatic speech recognition, which is what Alexa and Google Home is all about. Um, <clears throat> this is our pathway to the Internet of Things, verbal communication with a machine who will do what it tells you to do. You know that 20% of the search inquiries now on Google are voice, voice mm -hmm. questions? 
that's a remarkable statement, and that's going to grow every year. So we're going to start to control our universe, just like the Starship Enterprise. He's going to ask a computer a question or ask it to do something, and it will get done. And we don't even know how that's going to impact us, um, but there's no denying that it will. So with, with, with that assumption and that, you know, belief, what, what would you do to prepare yourself to take advantage of that? There are a few magazines now. I think Hearst, for sure, um, is getting their content onto Alexa. So um, I don't remember the exact magazine, but I know you can ask Alexa for a recipe on just let's just say meatballs, and she will come back from a magazine and tell you the recipe uh, verbally. And, or, because I've done this, send it to my phone. That's remarkable. That is remarkable. Now, what, uh, have you done that? Have you sent it to your phone? Yes, I have. Was there a, you know, it's one thing, you know, to get into Alexa and have the meatball recipe, but... But then even say, this is from Hearst. If you want more recipes, do this. Or what, exactly. what happened when you got when you got that? Like, how did they get it? You know, something positive. How did they monetize it? Monetize um, it? Were, yeah, but not necessarily with money, but yeah, with an audience. You know, name recognition, subscribers, whatever. So yeah, exactly. In in this case, um, I think that. Uh, it, it may have been a Betty Crocker recipe. I don't remember what I was looking up. Might have been ribs or some recipe. But um, Alexa asked me, would you like me to send this to your phone? I said yes, and it did. And there was ads next to the recipe. I don't, couldn't tell you what ads they were, but there you go. From a voice command to a visual ad right in front of my face. And that's, and that's the beginning. A and that's a great uh, value add. I mean, you could sell that for higher clip than, you know, a programmatic. You should sell it for 20 times the cost of a programmatic ad, you know, because that's obviously a real person who's getting it. I, I, I mean, but you're right. Who knows, right? Ad fraud, right? Who knows if they can start taking over that part of it? But I, I think that they're probably not there yet. That would be uh, very labor intensive. Um, but uh, so, yeah, that's how they did it. So they, they got into Alexa. Do you have any clue how to do that? Uh, how to make the connection with uh, Amazon? Well, yeah, with, with actually getting your – to come up when people ask questions like that. No, you know, I, 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 I don't know how you get into the game. Um, but obviously – uh, Alexa and Amazon are growing by leaps and bounds, and there's opportunities there that uh, we can hardly imagine. Awesome. Do you have any other predictions? I think it sounded like you might have had a couple. Oh, that's not enough. Two brilliant ideas in one day is not enough. <laughs> <laughs> not from you. Not from both Zachs. Are you kidding me? No, but no, so, seriously. I'll, uh, I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll I mean, tell that, you. That's some awesome stuff. Let's apply what we've thought about today. We talked about voice control and artificial intelligence and eventually, and we also talked about the artificial intelligence having a moral barometer. When you combine all of that together, it's, it's extraordinarily powerful. And yet we don't know what that's going to do to society. I have asked for a long time, what is the impact on a society when anybody can find out anything instantly. What's the long-term result of that? We don't know because it hasn't been around for a long time. But it's gonna be interesting. That our, tangent, our tangent spans have gone down, we know that. And we also know that there's been some false uh, expectation, or I don't know, expectations that are a little out of whack um, that, um, have, you know, instant gratification and all that. You know, we know that's all. I'm happening. not worried. I'm not worried about the attention span. Um, sort of brings me back to uh, Socrates. You know, he said the written word is the enemy of memory. Well, he was right. Socrates was against writing anything down. 
we don't seem to have done too bad since starting writing things down and our short term memory, if in fact that's true, well, maybe we don't need it if we can find out anything we want instantly. I don't know. Point. <laughs> that's uh, that, that is definitely a, a positive way to look at that. But you're, you're probably right, you know, I get evolution, right? We, we, uh, we take the traits that we need to survive in the future and leave the leave the other ones behind. That's well, what we've always done. Yeah, and that's where we're, I guess we're. That's a good point. Never thought about it that way. Yeah, there's some things that we just might not need, like math skills. <laughs> yeah, calculators. People's math skills went down, but they can still survive. Well, um, well, both. You know, this is a. Uh, you know, it's been very interesting conversation. I think it started a little bit on the wary side, but I, I think we ended up with, you know, there are some positive things that are developing and happening and, and we're in a, you know, a wait and see approach. Uh, and and I, I do assume that you're going to be on top of all this stuff and, and, you know, giving people some pointers and direction of, of maybe how to take advantage of some of these trends that, you know, will continue to evolve. Um, how can people keep up with you and learn, continue to learn from you? I would highly recommend that anybody interested uh, should join my newsletter, which you kindly pointed out is the world's oldest. Um, sure. Just go to my website, bosax.com, sign up, and you'll get uh, daily information about what's happening in the media world. All right, and that's with commentary. With commentary, yeah, good commentary. I, I get it every day. Uh, B O. S A C K S dot com. Bosax. Yeah, and you're also it. at Bosax uh, on Twitter as well. Yes, All sir. right. Well, Bo, appreciate it. Um, Thanks, David. Looking forward to uh, seeing w what happens in the future, and I'll, I'll keep up with your newsletter and, and uh, be one of the first to know. <laughs> Have a good this, one, man. This fun. Look forward to doing yeah. it again.